Good morning and welcome to the HKU Information Day for Undergraduate Admissions 2020. And particularly a very warm welcome to you all for joining us at this very first session of the day on non jupas admissions. My name is Vicky Chan. I'm the Senior Program Manager at the Admissions and Academic Liaison Section of the Registry at the University of Hong Kong. While we're not able to welcome you on campus today for our annual festivities, we certainly hope that you will continue to receive much needed information to help you decide which of the programs or opportunities offered by HKU will suit your aspirations best. And these aspirations of yours may be to become a surgeon or a lawyer or a chief financial officer or a research scientist. All of these are very realistic and tangible aspirations and are ones that HKU is more than ready to support you in achieving. We are that confident because, well, our peers in higher education have informed us that the University of Hong Kong is very well regarded in the world according to our rankings. And most importantly, the university is a truly comprehensive institution with subjects in a wide range of disciplines being regarded and ranked in the top 20 in the world. But most important for the university is that our students. The mission of the university is not simply to create or impart knowledge. It is through many opportunities available at the university to our students, whether they are academic or extracurricular in nature, that we aim to multiply the results attainable by our students so that they can aspire to become an inspiration for those around them. And so today, to help me illustrate this point better, uh, how it is all possible at the University of Hong Kong, we have invited two guests who will share their university experience with us. We have in the middle, Hinako, who is currently a year three student in the Bachelor of Social Sciences, currently at a crossroad between research or working in the industry, and we have Ibno to her left, a graduate from the Bachelor of Engineering program and is now still affiliated with the university as a researcher. So maybe let's start with you, Hinako. Um, I know that you have a very rare, and some may say rigorous mix of courses in your degree. Can you tell us more about that? Oh, so hi, I'm Hinako Kojima. I'm a year three student from the Bachelor of Social Sciences. So I was admitted to the University of Hong Kong through um, the local non jupa scheme. So I uh, was in a high school in, South, uh, in Hong Kong called South Island School, and I obtained my IB diploma there, and that's how I entered university. So to talk about my majors and minors, my major is psychology and neuroscience, and also for my minor, I have human resource management. So for psychology, I knew this was my thing when I entered the University of Hong Kong. So when I, I just knew that I liked psychology all the way from when I was 15, when I was doing my GCSEs and IBs, thanks to my teachers. And so for neuroscience, it was more like to supplement my knowledge in psychology in, from a specified biological aspect. Uh, so for this, I actually um, decided to take neuroscience from this major minor talk, talk from my faculty, where I was first introduced to all the diverse majors and minors offered by the university. And so first I knew I had neuroscience as my option. First I was really scared of taking neuroscience. It sounded too hard for me. I thought I needed to be an expert in sciences like biology, chemistry, physics, computer science. I don't have all that background. But then the teachers in the University of Hong Kong told me that if I have a background in one of those fields, then it'll be fine. And that's actually one of the admission requirements for the major. So because I really like biology, as I mentioned before, so I decided to take neuroscience in that biological approach. So for human resource management, um, I actually thought of taking this minor very recently, actually the start of this year, because um, I was actually supposed to go to my second exchange program this year to Japan, but it got canceled because of the pandemic. And so I was like, okay, I have this extra semester, I might as well utilize it fully utilize it, and I decided to take human resource management that I was really in interested from the start and yeah, take this opportunity because human resource management is really a subject that really illustrates the practicality of psychology, uh, like for example in the business field, really like in or every organization. So I just decided to take this as my minor. 
Actually, when I was considering all my majors and minors, I had a lot in mind. For example, I was interested in counseling and also criminology. So I took the introductory courses for that back in year one, but I decided, uh, I realized that it's probably not my thing and I decided to take this path. I see, so interest is very important for you and you found sort of things that combine your interest mm -hmm. together quite well in the yeah. social sciences faculty. Excellent. Ibno, I think your story is slightly different compared to Hinako's, right? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> so hi guys, my name is Ibno. Um, I'm a Bachelor of Engineering graduate from the University of Hong Kong in 2017. And I entered HKU in 2013. Um, I did GCE level, uh, the Cambridge curriculum, and I was an overseas student from Bangladesh. So um, as I said, I have done mechanical engineering, and uh, my field was not as diverse as Hineko's. Uh, I was very focused on what I want to study. My ultimate aspiration is to become an aviation engineer. So uh, when I came to HKU, I already had made up my mind that I want to study mechanical engineering. So I wanted to explore the different fields within mechanical engineering. Because mechanical engineering has a lot of different types of sectors like robotics, you have automation engineering, automotive engineering, aerospace engineering, energy engineering, and so on. Right? Um, but one thing I appreciated about HKU is when I came here in year one. A year one is a more general uh, engineering courses. So I had opportunity to explore electrical engineering, civil engineering, computer science, mechanical engineering, and so on. And then finally, I decided to become a mechanical en engineering student uh, from my year two. So I guess that's how my story is. And I'm, I'm happy that I, I did my bachelor's at HKU. Excellent. I'm glad you, I'm glad you say that. Um, it's very reassuring to hear from our graduates that you actually enjoyed your time. But talking about your university life, um, I think students also would like to know what sort of things do you do as a university student at HKU? So maybe extracurricular, research, clubs. I know Ibn and both Hinako, you also have some of these experiences as well. So maybe tell us a bit more. Okay, so for me, a key um, experience I had in HKU was my exchange. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I got my second exchange canceled, but I managed to go to my first exchange last semester. So this was at University College London in the UK. So there I um, was affiliated in a department called Arts and Sciences, which is actually kind of different from where I am, like social sciences right now. So that was like a program where it was like a very liberal version of liberal arts. I can take basically any course from any faculties. So there I took two psychology courses, one security and crime course, and then one other random course called Introduction to World Cinema. So I really enjoyed the experience every moment um, in UCL. Uh, I really thank the opportunity like um, from the University of Hong Kong that I managed to spend that time because it really opened up my future path. So um, I'm really, uh, I'm aspiring to um, pursue a postgraduate degree, probably in psychology in the future. But I really enjoyed the learning environment in the UK. So I really think that would be the goal I'm trying to go for right now. I really, uh, yeah, I currently aim to go for a master's in the UK. Uh, also, I want to talk about this ongoing experience right now. So that's my internship. So this internship is under my faculty. So it's under this specific program specific to social sciences called um, the Social Innovation Global Citizenship Program. So there I have to do either a term time, um, a whole year of internship or a summer internship, and I get paid with credits. And I need that for graduation. <laughs> yeah, so currently I work as an HR intern um, at the Financial Times. So that's really connected with my minor. This is also a reason why I try to take human resource management. So because I have the full experience as an intern at um, the Financial Times, and also I can know the, those theoretical knowledge in the University of Hong Kong. And currently I'm really enjoying it. It's only been a month. I've only been to office twice because of the pandemic again. But I'm really, it's really interesting to actually be in the off, like a part of the human resource team. This is like a very new experience for me. Um, right now, I'm looking at everyone's resumes and CVs. It's, it's, it's really fun, honestly, yeah. Well, maybe you will see some of your friends' resumes. Hopefully. Yeah, somehow. <laughs> no, what about you? Yeah, um, so for me, the highlight of my university experience would definitely be the outside of class learning. Uh, 
experiences. Uh, so I had, uh, I was involved in a lot of things when I was at the university. One of them was the student ambassador scheme. So I actually represented the University of Hong Kong at a lot of different events within and outside Hong Kong. Um, and also, I was also very active in my hall life. I was one of the student leaders of the hall. So, um, so those are the non-academic related uh, highlights of my university experience. Apart from that, um, because engineering is a very um, practical-based major, I would say, uh, there is only that much you can learn from the classroom. But the, uh, the, your main learning will come when you actually work on different projects. So I did a, a few projects. I'll talk about two of them. So as a final year project, I worked uh, on making a remote control aircraft. And we went to Taiwan for a competition where we won the first runners of award at the, in the advanced engine category. And the second one is more interesting, which I'm currently involved with. It's uh, uh, making a robotic fish. And uh, I'm happy that in January, we actually broke a Guinness World Record for the world's fastest robotic fish. So those are um, the best thing is like it's, it's a mix of different experiences. You're not only focusing on one thing, not only academics or only research. It, it gives you a lot of opportunities to develop yourself personally. Like you can have a lot of leadership skills and communication skills, so which, which is a very important soft skill, I would say. So I would say my university experience was very all-rounded. I was not focused on one particular thing. And I think that's how I've come to know you, right? Yes, We've met definitely. several times when you were still a student, and after you've graduated, you continue to share your experience yeah. with us. Um, definitely, and both of you actually represent a very typical profile of what we call a student at HKU, mm -hmm. very active, uh, you know, taking the opportunities that are available and knowing what to achieve, what you want out of it. Um, and I think we will wonder sometimes, um, how has the transition been for you? So moving from a secondary school student, uh, Hinako, you did the IB, it, no, the A-level, and these are qualifications I think a lot of people in our audience today are currently pursuing right now. How has that transition been for you uh, from A-level, maybe Imdo first, from A-level to university life? What did, what did you go through? So I think when I was in high school doing my A-levels, um, you are more uh, interactive with your teachers and you're more spoon-fed in the sense that uh, the teacher tells you exactly what to do and you have very little room to explore. But when I came to university, I realized that I'm on my own. I can choose to do my own thing. If I want to study, if I want to go to the lecture, I can. If I want to skip the lecture, it's fine. It's, it's on me. So it was not spoon-fed at all. The professors treat you like an adult. So you have already entered the adult life. So that was kind of like a shock to me that, OK, uh, there is no one to really guide me properly. So I have to be my own guide, or maybe I can talk to my seniors. So I would say that transition, it was not hard. It was very interesting for me and very exciting, actually. Interesting. Hinako, yours was more recent, <laughs> I would say. So how has that been? So actually, I think um, I did the IB diploma. I did the bilingual diploma at South Island School, as I mentioned before. So this really uh, made me ahead of the game in the University of Hong Kong. So one was really the literal bit. So I did my higher level subjects in psychology and biology. So I really had the background knowledge compared to like my peers. Um, and for example, for psychology, uh, in my introduction to psychology course, I pretty much knew most of the concepts because of my um, IB knowledge. Thank you to my IB psychology <laughs> teacher. And actually, the biggest thing would be how I, in IB, a really key concept is critical thinking. So it's not just swallowing knowledge. You have to properly like, chew it and assimilate it. So this method of learning, really, IB prepared me. So, for example, I think you guys are sick of hearing this, but theory of knowledge. So, yeah, like it's one um, component of the IB. And this here, we really had to constantly question our knowledge. Am I, like, I, we have to constantly question like, the two sides of the argument, not just learn a fact. We can do that independently, but this bit, like, you really have to, for example, talk to your peers and everything. And this, um, I guess, was the biggest thing that really helped me in um, the University of Hong Kong, like for example, all the essays and everything. Um, it's really not just like throwing out knowledge, you have to think it through, but really all the, all the essays in IB that I wrote really helped me. Also one thing like I think IB really helped me 
to prepare for the sleepless nights and all those sufferings <laughs> in the university. It's actually slightly better in HKU because you have more control of everything, as he said. I think I think and that's why we see a lot of IB students um, matriculating into HKU. I think I've heard from the IBO that HKU receives one of the highest number of IB scores, diploma scores each year. And that's a representation of, you know, IB students coming to the university. Um, I think maybe I'll pose one last question and um, for the students out there, if you have questions for our speakers, um, there is a function on your chat to actually leave your questions to us. And uh, if we have time at the end, we'll certainly get to your questions, but feel free to ask your questions in the chat session as well. But to wrap off this session with you, um, one last question. What went through your mind when you were deciding for university options? Uh, a lot of people may be going through the very similar process right now. So. What were you thinking? What factors came into play? Maybe tell us a bit why HKU uh, in the process? Okay, so to be um, very honest, so I'm Japanese, so definitely I had the pathway, alternative pathway to matriculate in a university in Japan. Uh, in fact, I did apply, I did get some offers, but one key thing for me is that, um, so I knew I wanted to do psychology, um, as something really main in my academics. So for all the um, universities in Hong Kong when I applied, so because we have two schemes, one in um, September and April, and for the April exam, you need like additional exams. So I wanted to go through the September um, admissions. But in that, like we didn't have a course offered to us as an IB, in, like international student um, to do psychology as a main subject. We only had some options to do it through a liberal arts scheme, like just as a one part. So that was my key um, reason that I um, decided HKU. Also, the second really practical bit is that, so I'm, from when I entered university, I knew I wanted to do a master's, probably in psychology. And one key bit is that I need to make sure my finances are all right. So because I'm a local student, the University of Hong Kong was a a relatively affordable option to me, which opens up the pathway for where I can go for my postgraduate degrees. And I knew that if I am an undergraduate applicant from the University of Hong Kong, this really would not hinder my application for my postgraduate degree. So those were like my two consider main considerations. Okay. Yeah, so I have a few key points that I considered when um, applying for the university and accepting the offers. The first and foremost being the rankings of the university. It doesn't matter where the university is or how the university is, what are the different options you have, but as long as the university is good, you can be uh, assured of your future. So I got that assurance from HKU looking at the rankings. Um, secondly, uh, it was because it was much more affordable for me as well, because because of the HKU's gener very generous scholarship scheme. My brother, brother was studying abroad at the time, so it was much more affordable for my family. Um, I did get offers from a couple of universities in the States, but I still decided to come to HKU because of the ranking, because I could trust HKU much more. And also it was closer to home. Another consideration, as Hinako mentioned before, was about the postgraduate studies, because I was also considering to uh, further pursue my degree. And I'm very happy that recently I got into one of the best schools for aviation in Florida, which is Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And the degree from HKU and the recommendation letters from the professors helped a lot, because most of the professors in HKU are very renowned international scholars. And um, for if, if there are some overseas audience, I would like to say one thing that uh, another thing that I did not consider, but I gradually found out was Hong Kong. Hong Kong is an amazing city, so which made me stay four years more than I actually intended to stay. So I think those are the considerations that I had and I gradually realized, and I'm very, very happy that I had a great experience in Hong Kong, yeah. Thank you, Ibnil, uh, and Hinako as well, I think. Um, hopefully, their experience helped give you a sense of the study options and opportunities uh, that are available and also give you a chance to imagine what sort of inspiration you can become to the community moving forward. Um, how the university achieves that actually certainly for our students, it's not only just about Hong Kong. 
Um, the University of Hong Kong, Hinako and Ibn both mentioned, has a lot of flexibility in allowing our students to explore what they would like to do. And it is exactly because of this flexibility we are able to allow students to compound on their experience. Uh, one of the very popular and most asked about uh, suite of programs at the university right now are what we call university collaborative programs. And these are collaborative programs that we now offer with very well-renowned institutions. I'm sure many of you will be very familiar with the names on the screen, um, UCL, Cambridge, University of California, Berkeley, uh, University of British Columbia, Sciences Po, Peking University. And through these programs, we expect our students to merge knowledge from different cultures. So it is not only about addressing the need for globalization, it is also about globalization, uh, which is a term that has been thrown around in recent years, where we're hoping our students, by completing a degree, in four years at two institutions, you are able to assimilate knowledge, assimilate culture, assimilate experiences to make your experience more fruitful as a university graduate. Um, we'll just highlight a few things for you. So the most recent addition to these dual degree programs is the one with the University of British Columbia. It is a BBA program at the HKU Business School with a Bachelor of Commerce at the Sauter School of Business at UBC. We will have a session on this, I think, immediately after this non jupiter session. Uh, we'll have a session on the, uh, this new dual degree, so be sure to tune in on that if you're interested. Um, and as I said, this is an experience for you. This is something that we expect students to find a lot more, uh, multiply the experience, the opportunities, and you have fun. Um, I, as someone who's lived in different parts of the world, living an extensive period of time in a different city is actually a very fun thing to do as well. Um, this is also in a way to address uh, some of the more pressing issues. So if we look at the recent report, reports by the World Economic Forum, you will find that actually we are looking at jobs of tomorrow. Um, and this is what the due degree is hoping to achieve for our students, as well as to make sure we're preparing our students to take on these jobs for tomorrow. Um, and the skills that are needed, as you see, um, analytical skills, complex problem solving, critical thinking, originality, flexibility, ideation. And I think these are things that both Ibno and Hinako mentioned in their sharing as well. And these are things that, through the due degrees, we hope our students will get, but also through offerings and courses at the University of Hong Kong. Some of you may already be familiar with what we call a Bachelor of Arts and Sciences degree. The five Bachelor of Arts and Sciences degree are in different fields, including applied artificial intelligence, financial technology, and design plus, which is uh, offering think courses on design thinking, uh, global health and development, and the more comprehensive global, global uh, Bachelor of Arts and Sciences degree. And you will find that these are the courses we are pro providing students in addition to dual degree programs to address these needs for new skill sets, new uh, capabilities in terms of the jobs of tomorrow. But one other program that you might be thinking about, and I think Ibno would have been interested in this probably if we offered it a few years before, um, it's a program called the Global Engineering and Business Program. Uh, in this program, it is a five-year degree program. We've uh, revamped this program, and we've also now offering students uh, from the non jupiter track to directly apply for admission into this program. In the five years of studies, you will be earning one engineering accreditation as well as a specialty in business. So you will be actually graduating with two degrees and you will have a major study options in both of these degree options. So if you're interested, we will also have another session on this specific degree program later on in the afternoon. And one last thing, and this is very specific, I think uh, this is a very new thing that we're also introducing to our students as well. Uh, if you're interested in science research, if you're interested in uh, being a researcher, a science researcher, you might be interested to know that the University of Hong Kong will now be offering a science masterclass program, which will allow students to combine a bachelor experience and a master's of research experience together in the four-year program. Uh, within this program, you're expected to have a very intensive research discipline. Uh, and also, you will be getting personal guidance from our science research masters. And these are fellows in science society. These are actually very well-regarded professors and researchers in their own right. And students interested in this science master class, you will be studying in one of the intensive majors. So these intensive majors have always been available to students in the Bachelor of Science program. But particularly for this science master class, you will have access and you will be studying under these intensive majors as well. 
So, um, as we move on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will be very welcome to take in questions from students uh, with regards to undergraduate admissions, uh, non gps applications, student experience at the university. But before while we let you type up the question in the chat, uh, allow me to go through a few admissions key points for you, uh, particularly for students who are going to be applying to the university this year. So, um, most important thing, um, the dates. Um, November 18th is the date you will want to be submitting your application to the university if you wish to have your ev application evaluated in the first round. And particularly for programs that we know are very competitive and programs that will look very heavily on interviews, we do recommend students to apply with the uh, first round evaluation um, in mind. We will move on to what is called rolling admissions following that, and that will start roughly in the new year all the way until August. So if you have, if you are still thinking or you're still preparing your materials for application to the university, feel free to actually consider using the rolling admissions. However, be mindful that it will only be subject to program availability, uh, also interview arrangements as well. So if you're very interested in the University of Hong Kong's program, do very much look at the November 18th deadline for your application. Uh, there are informations that you can check on the website. There is uh, what we call expected lower boundaries posted on the HKU website. That will help you assess uh, whether or not you are roughly in the range of being competitive for specific programs that you're aiming for on the application. And also, there are specific requirements that you will have. Uh, program specific requirements. English requirement, second language requirement. Usually for students coming in from IB or A level, like my, our speakers here, you will have met it with your GCSE English, uh, your IB group two language. These can be met with a variety of ways. So check on the website. You might already have met these requirements already. And also very important for students, uh, make sure you're actually applying with predicted results and that is fine. So don't feel like you have to wait for the final results to be available before you apply to the University of Hong Kong. We actually work with predicted results and you are able to update us on the application account on your academic achievements as well. So you will be able to do that. Uh, one personal statement, two references. So these are information that you will be able to supplement your application with or via when you're applying. So with that, I think that would be the end of the questions and the end of the Q uh, my sharing with you. What we will do is I see my colleagues have actually helped me pull up um, some of the Q&A. So I will uh, go through that and hopefully we'll be able to address a few of these um, within the time allowed. So the first question, how can I get a scholarship to study HK? I think Ibdo, you drew that one question out. Uh, so maybe allow me to answer that in a more general way. So all students are automatically considered for a merit-based entrance scholarship when you apply to the university. These scholarships will aim to provide uh, an amount that is equivalent to a full tuition fee waiver, a half tuition fee waiver. Um, there's no separate application involved. Um, however, you might also be indicating sort of special interest maybe for the Bachelor of Arts and Sciences program that I mentioned earlier. You might be looking at and there will be a scholarship attached to the program. So there might be program specific scholarships as well. Um, some of you might be asking because you want to know what is the highest level of scholarships available at HKU. Um, that would be the present scholars uh, uh, package and that is actually a full tuition fee waiver plus uh, allowances uh, for students on that program. Uh, so, how common and difficult is it for students to do a second major or minor? Hinako, maybe you'll tackle that one? Yeah, so for how common it is, I think it kind of varies on the degree as well. So for I think, for example, for Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Social Sciences, it's kind of common. Like, we are given, like, a number of credits that we can freely, like, choose what we can do. Like, we, um, specifically, for example, for the um, Faculty of Social Sciences, um, I can do, like, it's normal for me to do, to, um, majors like in terms of the credit load but also um so for what was the question again so it was like the, the second part it was like uh, oh, how, how, dif how difficult how difficult so in terms of difficulty uh also because i'm an ib student i got some academic standing so that was um 36 credits um worth one semester so i had that one semester free so i think it was much easier for me 
um, because I don't have those like requirements I have to do. But at the same time, I think it's um, like doable if you plan this really precisely. Like every year before I ch um, choose my courses, I take like one whole day to see if my major minor requirements are correct. Because actually, like I'm doing du a double major and one minor, and adding my acad um, academic sorry uh, standing, I think the 36 credits I mentioned about. Um, that's literally the maximum credit load. If I go one over, uh, I think I actually can't get you the have major to overload. Minor. Yeah, yeah. Over, it, it's actually overloaded already. So I think, in terms of difficulty, it's okay, but just plan it precisely. That's my advice. Yeah, and I think if you're attempting anything, I think double major um, is certainly more popular. Uh, of two majors and one minor, I think that is something very unique to HKU. Um, I think that is something. Um, offered because of the way we structure our curriculum and in a sense that is available. So it's doable, just have to be very careful uh, and be prepared that you have to work um, yes. quite seriously at your degree. So it is about your balance. Um, a question, how to write the personal statement? Um, if no, if yeah, no? maybe I can touch on that. Um, mm -hmm. So for personal statement, you have to be very precise uh, about three things, uh, two things, why the university and what why that particular major you're studying. You kind of have to have a layout of your future plans and how the degree at the University of Hong Kong will actually help you. Those are the major thing. Apart from that, you also have to write a little bit about yourself, like how you are as a person, what you enjoy, your academic and non-academic aspirations. So as long as you covered these uh, few points honestly and you can actually um, prove to the university that the, the degree at the university will help you to aspire your uh, life goals, I think it's good enough already. Anything to add, Hinako? Yeah, like, I just agree. <laughs> yeah, like, to be honest, like, um, personal statement, like, I wasn't actually so stressed about it because I think, like, in my school, like, you, all, like, you had all those guidance, just follow what your teacher says and it should be <laughs> fine, to be yeah. a, very honest. Yeah, yeah, that is true. I mean, I think we work very closely. I, I think I might have visited South Island myself when I was working with students. We actually work with the international schools in Hong Kong and overseas, actually. I don't think I've visited Ipno schools before, but <laughs> a lot of different schools in around the world I have visited, and we work with the school councils very closely um, to make sure your application is done right. So don't feel shy to reach out to your counselors uh, and if there are things that they're not able to address they will certainly come back circulate back to me or my team to help you with that um, I think I have a follow-up uh, for you Hinako on yeah. declaring the major mm -hmm. so when did you declare your major uh, what sort of thinking because uh, you mentioned there were some specific requirements as well so when did you declare these majors? Uh, so for us, I think we couldn't declare our major in year one. I think in year two, we can find officially declare in our, um, in our transcripts and everything. And yeah, that I just knew like I will do neuroscience from year one. So for specifically for neuroscience, we had to apply like by the by year two or like by some specific like time in early year two. Uh, like, okay, I have this background. I got this. I think it was like level three in like DC, DC or something like. It has to be that or equivalent, and yeah, it's just year two. You have you can change it any time. Actually, I think all the way to year four. So like, feel free to just declare it. It's not that big of a deal in a way. Like, for example, like if you're slightly not confident about it, but you still want the chance, then just yeah, you can declare. I feel like yeah, it's kind of more chill than expected in a way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and, and there was a second part to the question that I think Hinako hasn't gone through herself, so I'll pick that one up. Uh, how is it easy to change your majors? Um, in theory, you're allowed to change your majors. Obviously, what involves is when do you plan to change the majors? So uh, if you're in your first year, you're shopping around, you're doing your introductory courses, you're sampling different uh, majors, even in engineering, you do that, right? And mm -hmm. in yeah. your first year, you do introductory, uh, it's not exactly a general year, but you will be doing introductory courses specific to your field or discipline. It's just that you'll be sampling one or two more specializations in your first year. At that time, it's obviously very okay for you to want to change your major in a common admissions program. Um, but if you're in your year three and you suddenly realize that I'm in the wrong field, 
I'm going to want to change my major, you have a bit more consideration in mind because that will involve credits. Um, Hinako mentioned you do have to look after your credits to make sure you're able to graduate on time. So that is something to keep in mind as well. But um, in general, if you're trying to switch majors within your faculty, um, it is allowed as long as you've talked to your academic advisor in love, uh, make sure you have the right credits. If you're trying to change your degree program, which is another question that we've been getting, that is a lot more difficult. So um, be sure you know, are you going into your social sciences? Are you going to do arts, engineering, business administration? That will be something to keep in mind. So going on to more questions, um, if no, can we talk about this one? How was your residential experience at HKU? Uh, I think we're grouping a few together. What experience you enjoyed most? Mm -hmm. Extracurricular activities available to freshmen? Yeah, I can, I can go through the residential part. So I lived in one of the halls. Uh, if you look up on the sites, it's called the residential colleges, which are the newest halls at the University of Hong Kong. I think it was one of the highlights of my university experience because my closest friends at the university were actually from my hall. And the best part about the hall was the diversity of the people in terms of backgrounds, in terms of opinions. And you have a lot of activities in the hall that you can attend and you can meet new people and you can interact with a lot of people, which is one of the one of the opportunities I really liked about HKU that I get exposed to so many different cultures without even going outside Hong Kong. And um, so you also have a chance to uh, share your interest with other people. You can initiate your own activities, whatever you like. You have that flexibility. And uh, actually, in my third year, I, I actually ran an election campaign at my hall to become the student representative of the hall. And it was a very fun experience, and ultimately I won. That's why it's, it was more fun. So I think uh, the hall experience is, is very important mm -hmm. because you are going to spend a couple of years at that place. And if you can actually make really good friends from different backgrounds, you will feel like home. Uh, so I have to mention I'm actually still living in the hall mm -hmm. because I, I, I really helped the hall a lot. So they actually gave me a position to still stay and, and continue my good work at the hall. And it just feels like home. So I think residential the hall experience was really amazing for me. Here. Um, another qu very similar question, I'm just going to tackle, tackle it on. Um, were you involved in any other club society? They were actually, I think, um, probably an overseas student thinking about cultural diversity, uh, cultural celebrations. I know some of that has happened at Global Lounge you know, over the yeah, years. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we, we do have a lot of uh, different cultural nights. Like for my, my country, we have a South Asian night where we combine with India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh, Nepal. We do cultural nights together. And we do have, I attended, I did not organize, I attended a lot of Indonesian nights, Malaysian nights, Korean nights, European nights, things like that. So those are there for you to explore. But for me, the highlight was actually the student ambassador scheme, where I was very involved with the university. And I went to a couple of countries like Malaysia, Korea, and actually to promote the university, to speak for the university, I think, which was a, not a matter of just fun, but a matter of pride as well to represent my home institution. Yeah. Nice. Um, and I think we, we are getting a few cultural questions. Uh, so I think they're very interested to know what being in Hong Kong is like. Uh, Hinako, you don't speak Chinese as well, right? Yeah. I've been living in Hong Kong for 20 years. By... <laughs> yeah. And Ibn, have, how has your Chinese been? Uh, well, I did the basic level of Cantonese, <laughs> but here's the problem. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. The thing is, like in Hong Kong, uh, most of the people speak English. So there's not a real necessity to learn the language. But I learned it because, because of my fondness towards Hong Kong. I wanted to explore the <laughs> But I wouldn't say I speak that good. It's because I was not pressurized to learn it. So I did not have the real need to learn it. So it was, for me, it was more like a recreational thing and getting mm -hmm. to know the culture. So mm -hmm. if you're an international student watching this and you are concerned about the language, I can tell you it was not a, it was not a problem for me. And yeah, that justifies my like, yeah. lack of Cantonese knowledge. Yeah. For 20 years, yeah. yeah there you it's, go. it's fine. We've had actually, uh, we've had professors who've been with us and they actually been yeah. using English. We do, have, we do have quite a vibrant expat community in Hong Kong. Uh, actually, certainly at Kennedy Town, which is sort of becoming our home university yeah. town of sort, uh, has been certainly that, but also all around. Uh, we have a lot of colleagues and friends uh, who is, my, my Chinese is not actually that good as well. And, so yes, um, you would not have an issue going around um, in Hong Kong. Just have one friend who can speak English and Cantonese well and <laughs> yeah. stick to them. But I think, I think it's, a, it's a good thing that you yeah. come here and you start learning Cantonese. I would say that would make your life easier, but 
It's not mandatory, but mm -hmm. you're, you're going to stay here for a couple of years. Better make yourself at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Emil, I think we have a question directed to you uh, for and your personal statement. Did you write a statement? Did you remember your common app uh, personal uh, statement? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's the same. As for, for most universities, the same things you need to cover. Why that university? What you aspire to be? How that university is, are, uh, how that university is going to... Um, help you achieve your life goals and a bit about your own personal life. I think that would be very common for all universities. But of course, when uh, let's say you have HKU and you have a university in the States, there are different things you like about the university that you can address differently. What you like about that university and why specifically that university. But the general idea is, was for me at least the same for uh, applying to HKU and the US. Okay. Well, maybe I should tack on a little bit more uh, if it is uh, very specific about the application procedure as well. So, um, in general, if you are writing a personal statement for the Common App, uh, a lot of students have been instructed in the schools as well to write it a lot more about your personal experience, your extracurricular yeah. achievements. These are very excellent to know. I saw a question on the on the chat as well. It flew by the other uh, at, earlier about how important it is extracurricular. What you will find is that at HKU we do value a lot of these extracurricular activities, not by how much you've done, but particularly by how much you've learned from it. So what we're looking for, if you've seen our application, it actually teased you to tell us that by asking you to tell us how has your experience helped you address, you know, grow in a leadership ability, grow in global mindedness. I think these are terms very familiar for Hinako as IB student as well. Uh, but these are things that we definitely ask students to complete. So we will have that. Um, but on the, on the overall personal statement, please be sure to include what Imna was saying. What was your aspiration? Why that course? Um, academically, why does it make sense to you? That would be what we're looking for. Uh, it will be slightly more academic focused than a traditional US common app personal statement if you take it at the straightest sense. Um, I think we might have time for maybe one last question. Uh, let me go through what I have. So maybe allow me the time to go through a few very quick uh, application uh, session. I'll be very quick about this. So if you're looking at, uh, if you already are from Hong Kong or you have a native language that you speak but you don't have a certificate for it, uh, you, there are multiple ways. So you don't have to take an exam to prove your second language requirement. Like I said, your IB Group 2 might have met, uh, might have met the requirement. You might have it already at your GCSE level. If anything else, you might be a native speaker. We need some sort of letter from your school certification. So we can work with you in terms of these uh, second language uh, requirement. If you have taken SAT subject test, but will only be doing your reasoning in December, can you still apply? Yes. So as I mentioned before, and I'll re re reinforce it, I think Hinako, you applied with your predicted results. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, yes, no, as well, predicted results. So at HKU, we are okay to, for you to apply with predicted results or on the application, tell us what are the, uh, when do you expect your upcoming uh, examination results to be available and we will work with you on that. So yes, you are still able to apply by November 18th. Um, and we will look at your application uh, in that way. We might have to decide, we might need to wait a bit for your uh, reasoning or if you have enough information, then we will actually uh, make conditional offers based on materials that we have. Um, do we have time for one more question? I'm just looking at, okay, we can. So let me go through a few more um, of these that I see on here, because I see one or two questions that might be good for. Uh, is it possible to receive multiple offers from the same faculty? Yes. Uh, Hinako, did you have multiple offers? Do you no, know? I just heard like from my friends, I think they did. Yeah, it is possible. So what happened on that is on your application, you get actually, actually get five program choices. And so what will happen is when you're applying and uh, making application to five program choices, be sure to check. Some of these programs will say that they have a preference for first choice applicants. Some of these programs will not have that and they will be open to considering students with all choices. Um, According to your program choices, each of these programs will independently evaluate your application. So based on your materials, they will look at you as a candidate for their program. And if they find you admissible, they will make you an offer. So the multiple offer is not only just from the same faculty, it's actually for the programs that you've listed on your application. Um, following that, once you've received a multiple offer, you will be allowed to hold more than one offer 
on hand as long as you do not yet have your final results. So before your final results are released, we will be very happy to um, work with you uh, on allowing you to hold more than one offers. And then when your final results are out, you know whether or not you've met the condition on your conditional offers. That way, we will ask you to declare your program choice. OK. Um, is it required to submit a reference from a professor? No. 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 That would have been so, too <laughs> difficult. Yeah, I think I think the high school counselor or, or a yeah. teacher from the high school is. Yeah, I mean, so you might have heard rumors that sending more references <laughs> or professors or friends of the university will help your chances. Um, these two just have a counselor reference and they manage to get in just fine. So, not a necessity yeah. that you have to do that. Okay. Um, I see a question about very specific to programs. So perhaps as this is a more general talk, I'm not going to go into that. But do come back to the chat or do go to the faculties. Uh, and we are going to help answer those questions. Uh, address this one. Sorry, I'm flying through some of these questions. Uh, oh, dual degrees. Is there a separate application for dual degree? Yes. Um, Actually, each one of the dual degree programs have a different application process. So um, depending on which one you're asking about, uh, you will have to go through a slightly different arrangement. Uh, we Almost all the dual degree programs that we are offering at the university will have a separate session following this, the first one being the UBC session at uh, 1045. We also have the session with the University of Cambridge Joint Admission Scheme at 5 o'clock. The University of California Berkeley session will also be at 5 o'clock today. So if you're interested, definitely uh, tune into those to get more information about how you can apply. Um, I think my colleague will be posting a link in the chat for you uh, in terms of where you can find specific text information about the degree program. OK, so I think that may be the time that we, that may be the time that we have today. I know I did not get through all of your questions, but uh, hopefully we've addressed many of the questions you have in mind right now. And uh, I know my colleagues are actually at their chats right now in the booth trying to answer questions that you're typing in. So feel free to come in, uh, browse around the university uh, virtually. Our faculties have put in a lot of work to make sure you get as close to an in-person experience as you can at this virtual information day. Uh, ask any questions you might have through the chat or pop back into other uh, information sessions later on the day. We will be here all the way until 8 o'clock this evening. So it will be a long day, but hopefully you get what the information you need. So with that, um, thank you for joining us, and hopefully you have a very fruitful day browsing around the, the fair today. Thank you.